Hello, and welcome to this Beyond Clean virtual conference. The speakers for today's conference, the sponsors for today's conference, and the Beyond Clean team are all so excited that you're here. If this is your first time joining us for a Beyond Clean virtual event, I want to call your attention to a couple of event functions. All of the windows on your event screen are movable. You can shrink them, you can enlarge them, you can move them, whatever you need to do to create the event feel that works best for you. In the upper right corner is a resources tool. Download conference sponsor information and the resources and links that your speakers have provided for you. On the bottom left, you will see a Q&A or question and answer tool. Any questions that you have for the speaker during each session can be submitted to them using this feature. Our speakers today will bring you a wealth of knowledge and all of their information can be found in the speaker bio tool on the right side of your screen. Along the bottom are the icons for each of the windows as well. Clicking these will minimize and maximize each window. This will be an action-packed conference and there will be 15 minute breaks between each of the sessions. So feel free to grab a snack, check on the dogs or the kids, assemble a tray, do some jumping jacks, whatever you need to do before joining us again. Good morning. It is early in the morning for some of us, but happy Saturday. My name is Melanie Perry. I am part of the Beyond Clean and the Beyond Clean team and co-host of the First Case podcast. And on behalf of everyone on the Beyond Clean and First Case teams, I am so excited to welcome you to another exciting collaboration event. Thank you for joining us today for this one-of-a-kind global educational event dedicated to improving technical excellence in healthcare. I'd like to welcome back those of you joining us for another Beyond Clean virtual conference and also extend a very warm welcome to those of you joining us for the first time. Joining me for this exciting conference is my colleague, Brett Norton. Brett, we definitely have an exciting day lined up, don't we? Yes, we do, Melanie, and thank you for that intro. Um, yeah, it's bright and early for me. It's about uh, just over, just past 7 a.m. and sun's <laughs> just coming up, so um, yeah. A little coffee should help me going forward. But the title of today's conference is Pyrotech, Lighting a Fire for Technical Excellence. Our dynamic lineup of industry leaders, clinical educators, and healthcare professionals are joining us for a day of insightful presentations, candid conversations that are sure to inspire. Get ready to explore topics from patient positioning, safety, to the evolving value of education and certification. I would like to extend a huge thank you to our event sponsor, 3M, for making, helping to make this exciting day of virtual learning possible. I would also like to thank CCI for their collaboration for today's event. And real quickly, a couple of quick housekeeping notes. If you do have some issues with sound or picture quality, uh, sometimes that does happen in this world that we live in now, but uh, a real quick fix on that is to refresh your browser about 97% of the time that fixes the issue. Okay, and for those of you anxiously awaiting your CE credits, after viewing all of today's live sessions, you will be automatically transferred to the full conference survey. After completing the survey, then you will be prompted to download your six CE certificate. But that's not all. Um, I would also like to note that during each of today's sessions, you will see bonus content found in the resources window. This bonus content is available to watch and listen to today or on demand at any time that's convenient for you. Last night, we kicked off today's Pyrotech conference with a panel discussion that uncovered the dirty secrets of IFU noncompliance. If you were unable to join us, you missed a really good conference, a really good discussion, but don't worry. It's still part on demand. It's I'm sorry, hold on. <laughs> this on-demand panel is part of the CE approved bonus content in the resources window on the right side of your screen. So do be sure to check it out. We are so excited that you have chosen to spend your Saturday with us for this educational event dedicated to improving technical excellence in healthcare. I understand that you probably have a lot going on between work and home. And I just wanna say thank you for being here for being dedicated to education and for doing something that will help you grow as an operating room or sterile processing professional. So we invite you to sit back, relax, start the sterilizer load if you're sitting in SPD, but it's time to get this event started. So our first speaker today is Kelly Swales. 
She is a project manager at Census Technologies, Inc. Within her role at Census, Kelly provides Sensatrack utilization assessments and training. She earned her master's degree in organization leadership with a focus on employee engagement. She strives to help others understand the why behind what they do in sterile processing. Kelly holds four certifications with ISHM, earning her golden crown status. Today, Kelly is going to explain how an asset tracking system can optimize the accuracy of count sheets in your department. Gone are the days of recipe cards and Word documents. It's time to evolve to utilizing technology that will improve customer satisfaction, patient safety, and expedite reprocessing. Here are key takeaways from the expert on how you can help correct your department's count sheets today. So without further ado, let's welcome Kelly. Thank you, Melanie, and good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us on this bright and early morning here. Um, as Melanie said, I work for Census Technologies. Just a minor correction, um, my position is actually Director of Clinical Services. And so what that means is um, my team, we go out to hospitals throughout the US, Canada, Puerto Rico, and we go on site and just look at our customers' usage of Sensatrack. Along with that, then put together an assessment report and then provide training and other um, options. So that kind of, in, in a nutshell, is what our clinical team does. Uh, so a little bit more about my background. I started out in healthcare as a scrub tech. So I have been in the shoes of the OR as well as sterile processing where my last position for coming to census, I worked as a manager of sterile processing um, with about 55 staff members. So we're a very large uh, level one trauma center. Um, so I've kind of been everywhere throughout a periop and I know the frustrations that can happen with count sheets, um, whether you're in the OR, whether you're in sterile processing. And so hopefully we can all um, learn from here today, get some great creative ideas and get those count sheets to be um, accurate and then maintain those. So objectives here, my goal here and what we're really striving for is let's review how count sheets have evolved through the years. Along with that, let's look at that, how important is that accuracy? You know, it's not as just simple as saying, I need um, a mosquito and I need a adsin in here. We need a little more information. Is that mosquito straight or curved? Is that adsin with teeth without? Along with that, how with asset tracking systems, how they can optimize those count sheets. We can help you get that accuracy. And then along with that, look at the compliance with those. And then of course, it's then maintaining. So yes, your count sheets, they can be perfect. They can be accurate and we're gonna show you how to do that. So when you think of your count sheets, they're forever changing. You get this, someone comes in and says, oh, Dr. Smith wants to add two more mosquitoes to that general minor tray. Someone goes in and makes that change. Well, probably shouldn't do that because Dr. Smith only uses that set once or twice a month. Yet that set gets used every day by multiple surgeons. So just because one person says they want something someone goes in and changes because everybody has access to it. Well, not only are you gonna end up with a shortage because that means we, you know, we have 12 general minor trays, but if I need to add two, that's 24. And do we have an extra 24 mosquitoes laying around, but yet still be able to have some to peel pack um, and some as a backup if one gets damaged or is missing? So let's add in that tracking system. You can control who has access to making those count sheets. You can also then get more specific and showing it's not just an adsin with T, it is a specific, um, it's a specifically will tell you exactly, you know, V Mueller and L1400, so you know exactly which one to put in there. So let's look at good old recipe cards. So for those of us that are seasoned and have been around for quite a while in the OR, um, I don't like to say old, so we'll stick with seasoned. Literally your count sheets recipe cards, they were called a recipe back then. It would, they weren't a count sheet, they were a recipe. They were literally written on recipe cards and put in recipe boxes. If you're a larger facility, they may be divided up. Here's your general, here's your plastics, all the different recipe boxes. And then with that, you would see just a brief description of what goes in there. Well, you're lucky if you had straight or curved, but for the most part, everybody just knew. You just knew if it was straight or curved. 
Um, unfortunately, you'd end up with a um, one of these down here. So they have four Kellys. Well, if you hold those up, they all may be different lengths because they're all different manufacturers. Along with this, if one of those went missing, we were in trouble. So you'd find, you know, copies of it somewhere, some backup. Um, and time to get rid of those recipe cards. I have been to facilities and I have seen where they still have a box with recipe cards that are for clinics. And I've said, we need to get those into, sen into sense track. Let's get this figured out. You know, let's kind of time to get rid of that. Um, showed them how to do it. Great. They had it done on uh, one of the sites they had it done before I even left. So it's su super easy to get done. Along with that then is I go into facilities and I see they have like a little museum thing. I was thinking, okay, I hope there's a box of recipe cards in there because there should be. That is such a part of sterile processing in the OR. Uh, they should have those recipe cards in their little museums there. From recipe cards, we then evolved to a Word or Excel format of count sheets. That resulted then in all these multiple file cabinets throughout the department. Along with that, you'd always see the, you know, don't use the last sheet, make copies. And if someone accidentally used it, someone had to go into the computer, print out a bunch of copies. But along with that here, we still run into issues, where, or sorry, run into issues where it's not specific. We're not seeing on there exactly how many of something, or we're not seeing the exact measurement of something. Um, so still a lot to be done lot better than those recipe cards. Um, and take, keep in mind too then, you're writing on these. So as you're writing on these, and then you put them in a um, count sheet holder, attach it to your set, having to make sure that whatever you're using, that pen, that marker, is something that's not going to bleed. Many times I see that they just use a permanent marker. They know they're safe, great. However, when you're writing on a single piece of paper, that goes through, so you look at workstations and there's black marks everywhere. Me, that would drive me crazy, so I would sit there with alcohol and have to clean my workstation all the time, um, get all those black marks off. And so, well, yes, we, we evolved from recipe cards. There's still some that can be done. So when I think of your instrument count sheets, I always, I'm a firm believer in the why. Um, you'll hear me say the why a lot because I don't believe we should just say here, this is what has to be done. Here, this is what we need to do. It should be, here's why we need to do this. Here's why this has to be done. And so the whole purpose of your count sheet is to define what belongs in a container. So the number one thing on there is what belongs in a container. You want to be specific. Stove processing has a high turnover. We all know that. And so as new people are coming through, they need to know exactly what goes in that container. Many times I'll see that this container doesn't have a count sheet. Well, it's because it's a V Pro or a Sterad and it can't have paper. Therefore, we don't even have a count sheet. Correct. But I need to know that that camera and light cord that goes in there, what exactly camera and light cord? Along with that, is there a light cord adapter? Is there any kind of uh, bits and pieces of instruments that are in there with that? So you have to have a count sheet if you want accuracy if you want to be efficient. Because if I'm new and I don't know exactly what goes in something, then I'm asking someone. And then I'm thinking, oh my gosh, they're getting tired of me asking. So then I am working and trying like, okay, yep, this must be it. And maybe it's not. Along with that is you think, so when I started on healthcare, I worked six years at a smaller hospital and I worked four years in labor and delivery. So when I went to be a manager at a hospital and they did hearts, not a clue because we didn't do hearts at my um, first hospital and obviously not labor and delivery. And so I had no idea any of the heart instruments, actually none of the neuro either. And so I had a lot to learn, but yet you could say, well, you have 10 years of experience. Yes, but we never did hearts or neuro. So you want that accuracy in there. You want that specific information. The OR is gonna use that for part of their counting. They're also gonna use that, you're gonna use it for inventory control because I need to know exactly how many instruments I have, how many to kind of look at your um, full assets of your department. At the same time, if we're finding that we're running low on certain instruments, how nice that I can go pull up a report and see, we'll pick on those mosquitoes again, 
and I look and see, okay, we need more mosquitoes. We're always losing them. We don't have the backup. I can run a report and I can see here's the mosquitoes and here's what sets they're in. I can give them to the service leaders and say, do you really need all these mosquitoes in here? And this one set has eight in there. And I say, oh no, we could go down to four. Well, there's four of those sets. So now I have 16 extra mosquitoes. So it's a nice way to have some inventory control to know your, you know, what is really being used. What can I look at? What can I pull from there to put into field packs along with for instrument ordering? If someone tells me, hey, we need more add some with teeth, can you order them? Well, nice if I have that product information. And if I ask that person, they may say, well, I don't know. And they may end up where they start, they don't ask anymore because they, you ask too many questions or because they don't have that information. Well, how nice that I can just go right into my asset tracking system. And then from there, I can look and just see, okay, which one, who is a preferred vendor and then get that information right from the count sheets. And then I know what to order. So count sheets in the OR, I'm a, as I said, firm believer in that why. I really feel sterile processing needs to understand how count sheets are used in the OR and why it's so important and then vice versa. So those count sheets in the OR, they have to be accurate. I think of when I started scrubbing and I would look at that count sheet because if I didn't know an instrument, it was nice to be able to look and see, um, you know, exactly what is this. So if that preference card said to put something up on my mail stand, and I wasn't quite sure what that was, um, take for example, if I was doing a major ear, cause I don't, I never liked ear cases, so I didn't really learn those instruments too well. At least I could look on that count sheet and I could see then exactly the product number and then find that one on the instrument and then know exactly which one had to be put up. When you have incorrect items, it leads to total frustration. Sometimes it's, I mean, you take to think of it as life and death, but we know it can happen. I mean, if you have a stat C-section and you're missing something, or you have a, um, a, a heart case and you have a bleeder and it's returned to OR. So it's very critical and crucial that we get those instruments in there. Yes, you're gonna, you know, we can, it, it can cause delays, which no one likes delays. But along with that, I think more importantly is the, the patient outcomes from that. Uh, incorrect placement. So on your count sheet, it should specifically tell you what goes on a string or what goes in a pouch, what goes in the bottom of the set. Especially for a newer staff coming into sterile processing, do they realize how delicate some of these tips are? Do they realize how easy it is to bend some of those tips? So putting that placement in there, there again, you're gonna minimize that frustration in the OR and then incorrect quantities. So if I have a count sheet and I'm just handwriting something in, can you read my handwriting? Do you know how many I put in here? Along with that, if my counts are off and I'm really, and I'm going through, um, I could put in there that I put six mosquitoes in there, but maybe I only put five or maybe I put seven. And so we can't really figure out why that, that number is off. With that asset tracking system, you can have 100% accuracy. Next onto your count sheets and sterile processing. Think of that as this is your rule of instructions. So we talked about vice versa for that why. It's easy for the OR to say, hey, we want to add this to the count sheet. Let's take this off the count sheet. And the service leader says, yep, let's take this off. Let's add this. But you need really to be more than that. You have to say, okay, I want to add, um, you know, I want to add three or sorry, I want to add four caramels to the set. Okay, well, give me a product number, a manufacturer, so we make sure we get the right size. We make sure we get everything in there that should be. Along with that then, if you don't have those placements, you're gonna end up with damaged instruments. Someone comes to me and says, look at how this was put together. One of your staff did this. And I go look at that count sheet where there's no placements, nothing says what belongs on a stringer, or um, you have small items, they didn't use a pouch, and so they're falling out of a basket, or they're getting damaged, or the tips get caught in the little holes of the basket. So here again, we're back to that why and why we want to make sure that everyone is understanding where each other is coming from and the importance of that. So as I mentioned, the asset tracking system. So with an asset tracking system, you can have specific instrument information. So if I have marked instruments with a unique identifier on there, that is, um, so like for our company, we have where you can put a sensor mark on an instrument. 
and then you commission it and you put in exactly the manufacturer's item number. Um, it'll populate and just pull up the manufacturer description. So if I have that on my account sheet saying, here's a manufacturer, here's the item number and that um, description of what it is, and I'm building that container and I'm assembling, I scan that instrument and it goes in there. I get a pop-up that says, stop, this doesn't belong in this set. I look at it and I'm like, oh my goodness, I almost put this in there and it doesn't even belong. Or I look at this and say, well, wait a minute, but I hit my substitute button and I see I have some substitutes in there because as you know, every facility has multiple vendors of all their instruments. You can then go and um, see is this a, if, if this wasn't approved substitute, it, would, it wouldn't pop up. It would just let you add it. And <clears throat> I look at this and I say, okay, this should be on the list. And so I talk with leadership, hey, I found one here that needs to be added. So I add it. Leadership then goes in and approves or denies some of those substitute requests. So it's a nice way to verify that you're putting the correct instruments in there. And that when something calls for a seven and a half inch specific clamp, I'm not putting a nine inch or a 12 inch in because it's gonna pop up and say this doesn't belong. And then I realize I have the wrong size. Along with that, you're going to see pictures. So back with your recipe cards or your Word, Excel documents, um, we always had a, a binder of pictures that were kind of kept separate. So if I needed to know exactly how this placement should be, I would then go over and pull that picture. We had a stat C-section tray that was literally just to get the baby out. It was back when you put roll towels in your, in your sets and everything. Um, and literally would put a roll towel, put your instruments just in order so that as a scrub, I didn't even have to look. I could just do this and get that baby out. That we had a picture of because it had to be the exact placements. However, here is my recipe card or when we evolved to Excel and we're using that, but over another um, area was where the pictures were. So I have to go grab that three ring binder and then make sure that placement was exactly as it should be. If there was a change that was made to one of those, you'd have to go and somehow tell everybody, hang signs all over the department because we didn't know. And if I've assembled something a hundred times, and so I don't need to see the picture anymore. Will something change? Then I'm not going to look at that picture. And so if I don't know that, how am I going to know that we need to make some adjustments here? Um, along with that, think of your laparoscopic cautery items. You have to do an integrity test. You have to check that insulation. Make sure that insulation, it's all intact. There are no holes because you're going to burn your patient. Your um, arthroscopic shavers. You're to use a boroscope and inspect and look at the lumen. And it's one thing to say, yes, we have everything. Um, it's another thing to say, yes, but are you using it? And is it being done? So if you have an asset tracking system, and I have um, noted in here that this laparoscopic um, cautery item requires insulation testing. <clears throat> when I go to add it to my um, container, I get a pop-up saying integrity test required and it tells me specifically, you must perform insulation testing on this. Was this performed and did it pass? I do the test, I click yes. It, it lets me add it to my container. If I'm peel packing, same thing. Now, if I'm to click no, that I didn't do it or no, it didn't pass, it's not gonna let you add it to the container. It's not gonna let you do a peel pack. Along with that, you can also see what was previously missing. So if something's missing and you've got all this, you spent all this time trying to find it, well, now I see that, oh, it was missing last time. I just need to check backup stock. So all of this plays in to your count sheets and the, um, the importance of having accurate ones. And then with that, you're going to have accurate traits. So your accuracy is just going to explode with perfection because of the fact I've got everything as it should be. It's all user-friendly for both SPD and your OR, and it makes everybody's life a lot easier. So building a count sheet, think of your recipe cards. Yes, easy, grab the white out, make a change, or just hand write something out. However, making those changes, eventually over time, they got to where you just had to just create a whole new one and write it out because there were so many white out marks on there. So many people just crossed something off. Someone changed a six to an eight. Um, so a pen just wrote over something. And so now you go to the electronic version with an asset tracking system and right there, you've got the ease of just building that count sheet. You've got options. 
and then you can move things around. So do you want this set up so that when the OR reads it, they're reading how that set is from top to bottom? Or do you want that count sheet built for the assembler to where it's gonna put your heavy things first so they go in the bottom of the set? And then along with that, then you come up with the delicate stuff last because that's what's on top. So talk about count sheet accuracy. As I'm entering in something, it's gonna populate and pull through. So I don't have to type out, if I was in a Word document, type out V. Mueller every single time, NL 1400, add some with teeth, one by two serrations, et cetera, et cetera. It's gonna populate and autofill for you, which is wonderful, which is great because everybody likes to be efficient and everyone, everyone likes to do things the easy way. Here's kind of that container assembly that we talked about. Whereas I'm assembling, I can add things, I get the pictures, I can see what was previously missing. Um, I can add notes that will just print out on that count sheet. And it's all digital, so no one's trying to read my writing. Here's your electronic count sheet coming to you. It's telling you exactly what's in the set. And then along with there, there's any notes. Um, it's gonna tell you who assembled it, who printed it. So all easy, accurate, wonderful ways to use this. Count sheets can always be customized. So here, for example, I have your first count, your closing count, your final count. So count one, two, and three. Uh, if you need to add an extra column, take something away, rename those, those headers. Um, it's all doable, can all be done. Along with here, you'll see where it says, you know, Jarrett 115-167. And so that's telling you exactly which knife handle should go in there. If your substitutes are built in then, if I have a B. Mueller or a Codman or an ASCII left in my hand and I'm scanning that in, it's gonna tell me that, yep, this is acceptable or it's not. If I'm not scanning, I can also click just on that substitute and see what's, what's approved in there. So missing items. Yes, gone are the days. You know, I think when I first started out, if something was missing, you just left it down. If we need it, we'll flash it. And we just have a rack that was just all missing stuff. And not a big deal. We'd order the new part, we'd hope to find it, or we get sent down to our main uh, facility accidentally, wait for it to come back. And so if you had something missing, it wasn't a big deal. Well, gone are the days of Flash, which is now IUSS, but back then it was Flash. And so how wonderful to have this count sheet. And it tells you, hey, it's incomplete. There's something that's missing. You're gonna print out a missing label. You're gonna put that on that blue wrap. You're gonna attach that to, if you if you have a tag, like the disposable luggage tag, you're gonna put that on there. I like different color-coded labels for missing because it's gonna stick out. We're gonna see that. Um, I think of, you know, yes, we still, we put everything up. Even if it's missing, still put it up because you never know when that set can then be used. I, you know, I can't use it for this procedure because it's missing um, a grasper. However, I can use it for another procedure. And then if you have that bright pink label or bright orange, or if your disposable luggage tag is a bright color and you know that's only used for missing, you can put that plain white label on there. It's gonna be an attention getter and you're gonna see that. Along with here, your quantities, it's gonna tell you what should be in there, but what's actually in there. So at the end, you've got seven out of eight. So if you're doing a count and your counts are off, you can't figure this out. Now you're going through your instrument list Okay, do I have a knife handle? You know, do I have a, um, do, I, do I have this for, forceps? Do I have this, do I have that? Nice to see this accuracy here so that I, I know exactly what should be in there. So to our count sheet accuracy. So too many hands in the pot will spoil the sauce. Kind of where I say, you know, you don't want too many fingers in the pot. I see many times there are way too many people that have access to count sheets. My recommendation is like two people per facility having access to those count sheets. If you're a multi-facility and so you have uh, multiple hospitals that are on one account, then I say it should be no more than one person. So it's not every day that you're building a new count sheet. It's not every day that you're making a change. So if I'm on vacation and 
they need to make a change to account sheet. And this is the service leader, you know, who is someone that has that approval. So they may have to call the other facility and say, can you go and make an update to our account sheet? Or it's simply saying, you know what, Kelly will be back next week. Can't wait till then. Yes. Along with that, there's a lot more to that. So we talked about those mosquitoes and adding two more to the stats. Well, that's 24 mosquitoes. So you don't want, say, all the service leaders to have access to their account sheets because they can go in and just make the changes themselves. No, because there's more to that. We need to make sure we have those instruments in stock to change that. Along with that, if I make a change to account sheet, do you want me to open up all the containers, add, add or take out those instruments, and then re-sterilize them, or just leave them as is, and the next time they come through, then that next assembly will have the um, additional or subtraction of, of instruments in there. So there's a lot that goes into this. I mentioned too when they say someone comes to me and and I see this I always see this with preference cards and count sheets to say you know we need to add this and that to the count sheet we need to add this and that to the preference card well just because they said it one time or used something one time doesn't mean it gets added um, along with that it's not just what that surgeon wants if it's a tray that is used by multiple people you have to have that consensus so if you're at a facility look at your um, count sheets and who has access to those. Um, make sure that it's not just everybody and make sure that if you're in multi-facility and you have a, um, you have multiple facilities on your account, you have to come to an agreement on the nomenclature for instruments. So if I have an instrument and it's something that's unique, it's not in the global database and I go to put this in, what am I doing for my description? So with this description, if it's brand new, you probably have the package, can, uh, the box that came in, um, the label that's on that, that container that came in. I always recommend putting in there the exact manufacturer description. I've seen facilities where they put the noun first. So it's clamp, it's um, scissors, it's whatever that noun is. And that way, if I'm looking for something, I can type in that noun and then find it from there. So it's whatever works best for you, but the key thing is not too many people having that access. Um, along with that then, when there's a change, communicate that change. So communicate it to all of your SPD and OR staff. I know we talk about, you know, a lot of facilities, there's a lack of communication, or we need, we need more improved and better communication. And here's a simple way. Anytime you have a change to account sheet, make sure that gets communicated. Um, I'm, I'm guilty of this. I would do this even before we had sense track in our facility. And then once we got it, some of those sets, I knew like the back of my hand and I would go and assemble and then I go through and click the button. Well, if a change was made, would I know that? Maybe, maybe not. So if you make a change, you want to communicate, which is kind of that double edged sword because I shouldn't have to, you should be reading that count sheet exactly as it is and plugging everything in exactly as it is. And you would know that and you would see that change without having to be told. Um, but we know we're human. Everybody's trying to rush and everyone's trying to hurry because she nowadays with staffing shortages. So what are you, whatever you, we have to do to work together um, for that accuracy. So accountability. I really believe Accountability is one of the main um, issues in healthcare. Um, it's it, it, sometimes it can be very challenging to hold people accountable. Uh, maybe it's because they're their union. Maybe it's um, for other reasons. But when it comes down to it, I really feel people have to be held accountable. That is what what they're doing in stroke processing. What they're doing in the OR, accountability is could be life or death could be life or limb, as we say. And so with that accountability, uphold your policies, your SOP for what is required. So if you have someone that is just going through and click, 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 um, and they're not really paying attention, and so their account sheets are, their assembly is off, where is that, account, where is that accountability? Or is, you know, holding them responsible for what they're doing? Along with that, um, if you've got too many fingers in the pot, 
with those count sheets and everybody's making changes. Well, where's the accountability when one's wrong? Because if I have access to make those changes and a doctor says, hey, I want these added and I add them, I only did what I was told. So you have to really kind of view this whole thing. And then along with that, um, run a report. If you have an asset tracking system, you can run a report. So run that report and identify the changes that were made in the last week or the last month, and then audit some of those containers to see, is it really accurate? Is that nomenclature um, placement? Um, is everything as it should be? Check, check the spelling. Um, you, you know, I don't want to give access to somebody that maybe is not a good speller. Um, as we know, I mean, I still will see instruments and I see wheat lantern. And it's like, there's no D in that word. Um, and so some of that will really drive us crazy. Um, when we look at recipe cards, Word and Excel documents, we all know that what this should say. We all know what this means, but no one really wants to take the time to make that correction. And so therefore it's just always stayed that way. Well, if I was using an asset tracking system and I was going through and I was um, entering that in, as I type in NL 1400, it's gonna pop up and populate for me that as I don't have to worry about spelling AdSend or as I, I type fast and yes, I make lots of typos, um, but thank goodness for spell check and everything or something that's just automatically correct for you that you're going to have that correction in there and you don't have to worry about it. So let's think of our accurate count sheets. So accurate count sheets, they're going to end up with your OR, happy surgeons, happy OR staff members, your counts are going to be um, hopefully more accurate, or at least if I if my count is off and I'm going through my list and I'm trying to find what's what, at least I know exactly what should be in here. Um, maybe I counted first and said we have you know yep there's 35 instruments, and I did that count, and our counts off, and I'm only having 34. I keep looking and we can't figure this out. And we're trying to figure this out. And I look at the count sheet and I said, well this says there's only 34 instruments in this set. Did we add anything during the procedure? No. Okay, so now you go through and look and do that count and well, everything's here. So it's just going to help with that with that count. Um, we all want those positive patient outcomes and we all want to minimize our delays. So accurate count sheets are going to help with that. On to SPD, you're going to have happier text because my count sheets are specific. I have a count sheet. So if I'm assembling, as I said, this camera light cord or this flexible cystoscope, I know exactly the little valves and the adapters and everything that should be in there. And I want to make sure that those are in there, not just everybody assume and know what goes in there because I'm new, so no, I don't. Um, along with that, then, if I can be more efficient with my assembly, I can get more done. I know it's always qual quality over quantity, um, but we know there's a push for that quantity too because of staffing or because of shortage of instruments. And so if I have that count sheet and it is specific and it tells me exactly what goes in here, no questions asked, as I'm scanning that instrument and I'm scanning and I'm scanning and putting it in my set, it goes quick, it goes fast, and it's accurate. If I try to add something, I get that pop-up says this doesn't belong in here, and I look at it and go, oh my goodness, you know, I thought this was a, um, I thought this was a Rankin and here it's a Kelly. And at our facility, you have to use specific, either a Rankin or, or a Kelly. Whatever's on the count sheet, it has to match. Um, so it's going to let me know that, and then I know I, I have exactly what's required and exactly 100% um, accuracy because I'm doing exactly what is on there. On then to your facilities. So let's go way up to the top, and when they're looking at your delays in the OR, um, what's causing your delays? And I don't, even, I don't even know what the price is nowadays per minute in an OR, um, but it probably would, maybe I don't want to know, uh, might be a little shocked. I remember years ago, years and years ago, it was $60 a minute, and I know it's way beyond that now. Um, I think that was like when I first started out working in the OR. But so with that, think of those delays. And I could be delayed five minutes because of an uh, instrument issue, and yet think of how many instruments I could have bought with that money. So let's really look at this, make sure those count sheets are good, and then keep them going, keep them accurate. Um, even if you don't have an uh, asset tracking system, look at those count sheets because if you've got too many fingers in that pot, you got too many people that have access to that, 
that's where you're going to run into issues. That's where you're going to run into problems. Um, look and see what don't I have account sheet for. And you can always create that account sheet for those steroid and vPro items. With that, you take that account sheet and you go and you um, attach it once it comes out of the sterilizer. So if I have specifically, it says, you know, I, if it's like a plastic container that attaches to the, um, that attaches to a rigid container like the handle, I can make, you know, write on that or put a label on that that says exactly which one that goes to, or if it's just always permanently attached when it comes out, then I put the coat and sheet in there. So that way then you know exactly what goes in there and in cell processing and the OR knows what goes in there. And so then the goal of that is your return on investment. Look at the time we're gonna save, that accuracy, um, your patient satisfaction, your patient outcomes, and then also with your instrument purchasing. Instruments are expensive. And so if I can um, realize I don't need all these instruments in here, or someone is saying, yep, we need to add this to this, we need to add this to this, and you're buying all these instruments to add, and really who gave the approval to add those, your instrument budget is gonna have to be increased, or you're just gonna be over budget. And so what a great return on investment is to minimize who has that usage, or sorry, access to your, uh, your count sheets. Along with that is maybe it just needs to be a consensus. So if I wanna make a change, then it's, um, even though I'm the service leader, if I wanna make a change to a count sheet per a surgeon's request, maybe I need to reach out to my other surgeons and say, what are your thoughts on this? Do we, do we need to increase this? Do we need to add this, change this? And then that will help you to have um, your account sheet success and then to maintain that. All right, so I'd like to open this up to questions. If anyone has any questions, um, any more to discuss, please let me know. Okay, we actually do have um, a couple of questions in here. Um, the first one is, when working with SPD and OR and training them on tracking systems, do you first need to make sure there's a firm understanding of all instruments being used? So I'm not sure what you mean by a firm understanding of all instruments being used. Um, yeah, I can reiterate on that, Kelly, because um, it's my question. Um, I think, you know, because <laughs> I think um, when you're talking instruments in the OR and, you know, just in general, they, they can be overwhelming for, you know, SPD techs. And so I think, um, and you mentioned earlier in your presentation about, you know, just knowing what you're working with, right? So I think the question would be geared towards, you know, do they have to really know each and every instrument um, by name, the functionality and everything in order to really implement it or, you know, correlate it with the tracking systems? And no, and actually, and, and so in my personal opinion, I think a tracking system is going to help you learn those instruments. So if I knew, and you know, so depending on where, I'm in Minnesota, and we have multiple still processing schools. So for the most part, at least my, in my last facility, we didn't hire anyone just off the street, as I would say. Um, to come work for me as an instrument assembly person, uh, you had to have either years of experience or you had to have that schooling. That's not always the case in, in a lot of facilities. So if I'm coming from housekeeping, I'm coming from off the street, I don't know my instruments, I need to learn them. And so what I like with an, with an asset tracking system is that I can type in NL 1400 in my peel pack and it's gonna populate and it's gonna tell me this is an Adson with teeth and it's gonna show me a picture. And that's a great way then for me to learn my instruments. And then the same thing with that, when you look at that utilization is I can run a report to see, okay, where all are, are these instruments at in containers? I can run a usage report to see how often are these containers used? And if I've got a container that has some great instruments that would be great in a peel pack and that, instrument, that container gets used once a year well, can we pull some of those out? Can we, let's review this container, are all these instruments needed? And so I can repurpose them and um, save some money. Ah, oh, great answer. Okay. Yeah, I think that's, it's, it's almost, uh, 
a hands-on reference book. So that's that's perfect. Yeah. <clears throat> yep. I have a question for you. That's a, it's a me personal question. I'm an OR nurse. And in, towards the end, you were talking about um, when a surgeon asks for an instrument to be taken away or added to the set, um, but then maybe getting a general consensus from other docs who are using that tray as to whether or not that instrument should be there. What do we say to the doc who's demanding that we get it? Or how do we make that surgeon happy who is wanting that instrument if maybe we shouldn't be adding it to the tray? Right. And so there again, we come back to my, my why. So communication and explaining that why. And so if your hospital is set up where anytime we're, we're making a change, so let's just take our general service and we say, okay, you know, here are my three surgeons that are, um, are my consultants for making changes, whether it's to an instruments, it's a drape, it's whatever. And so then with this, I go and I say, hey, I've had a request to add two more mosquitoes to the general minor tray and get their consensus. They may say, oh yeah, I've been thinking we should, but I have never said anything. Or if it's kind of, no, no, we don't use that. I would then go back to that surgeon and explain, you know, I checked with our, our general surgery committee or whatever you want to call that. And um, we don't feel that there's a need to add those and explain the why. That would mean maybe that would put that set over 25 pounds. Maybe that, you know, that would mean that we have to buy 24 mosquitoes. Um, and it could be even, think of it if it's a more expensive instrument. Mosquitoes are pretty cheap, but think of it if it's one of these more expensive instruments. Um, and then along with that, say, but here's what we're going to do. We're going to, um, on your preference card, we're going to just put on there that we need to open up a peel pack of two mosquitoes. So you'll never know that it's not in the set because while it's in the peel pack, it'll be added, it'll be on that mail stand. You know, some may say, I wouldn't even tell them. I just update the preference card. <laughs> no one tell them. Right. But on your surgeon, <laughs> your surgeon, that may be the best route, but we're not right. going down that yeah. path. Um, <laughs> but there again, you know, communication and explain. And Very if good. you explain yeah. it to them, you know, it's like, hey, just so you know. No, that's, that's a good solution, I think, yeah. So, um, okay, another question. When you're scanning trays, how much time is added to your prepping of trays if you have to scan every instrument versus just throwing everything in out of memory? And when you add an instrument tracking system, is there time added, I guess, to that? Yep. So if you think of, you know, when you're, let's go back to your, your recipe cards. And I'm just grabbing and I'm putting everything in there and I'm putting on the stringer, everything, and I just kind of shove it through. And we didn't have a count sheet, didn't go with. Then we went to a Word, Excel document. And so then I would add things to it and I would, you know, then grab my pen, check off, I put four in there, add my next four clamps, check off right on there. And so as you're doing this, it, it's time consuming and we only have two hands. And typically it's your dominant hand you write with, your dominant hand's the one you're adding your instruments with. So as I'm doing this, I'm going through, if I'm scanning, I'm just a quick scan, put it on there, scan, put it on there, scan, put it on that stringer. So it ends up being either the same amount of time. If not, you're going to save time. And then along with that, you're going to get that accuracy. So if it ends up taking you know, 30 seconds or a minute longer, but you have accuracy. And so for over the course of a month, I've added 30 minutes on to my assembly because of the fact I'm scanning, but look at the time I could save if something was wrong or incorrect and the OR gets it then. Now they're running to find a peel pack. Now they're running you know, in and out of that room. So there's a lot of things that we can't measure room traffic control, because I'm not having to run out and grab things. Um, having to use something else, now is that surgeon not a happy, or happy camper because we had to use something else and not what they really wanted. Okay. All right, and then let's see. Can I've you elaborate? One. Oh yeah, yeah. go ahead. <laughs> um, so, I guess, Kelly, I, I know that everybody in this day and age is always interested in data, right? They want numbers and they want percentages. And so I think um, a, a question here would be, 
are you able to elaborate on how department efficiencies have increased with the use of these new tracking systems? You know, I, maybe percentage wise, uh, something that you have seen in, you know, your visits to hospitals. Um, you know, of course you've got speed, turnover, accuracy, which you've mentioned, but you know, anything uh, concrete as far as, you know, numbers are concerned or, you know, any other insight on that front? Yep, so I know we do have, um, I know our, our um, company does have all those numbers broken down and it's through studies that have, you know, gone on through the years and then updated periodically. Um, do I know those numbers off the top of my head? I don't. Um, <laughs> sorry, my apologies, should have had that. I should actually should just know that, but I go in when you already have our product. Um, right, yeah, in, that makes sense. In my assessments in general, you know, when I'm out doing assessments and we're looking through things, um, a lot of that comes into play with compliance. So when you're looking at what's um, your, your quality feedback, so your quality feedback reports, joint commission, they'll say, show me what you have for your quality program. Show me, I had a surveyor one time that looked at and um, looked at my Gemma board and talked about our accuracy. And yes, one of our main things was how we had issues with forgetting that chemical integrator. Well, add it to the count sheet. Now that count sheet, the OR needs to understand that chemical integrator is on there. Um, it's not an instrument, but it's on there. But there again, I feel it should be counted because think of uh, some of your retractors. You know, my um, ribbon retractor. I could have a, count, or a chemical integrator stuck to that and not see it. And then now I go put it in a patient and that chemical integrator is now in the patient. I mean, there's multiple reasons why you really want to count that in there. But when I added that then to the count sheet, and it was there, and they knew they had to add those with that placement, then you saw that our uh, missing uh, chemical integrators, it was a decline. And this was a um, wonderful surveyor. And he was like, oh my gosh, this is so impressive. I love this. And it was a simple, yes, I just added the count sheet. And so there they were my compliance for that. Um, along with that is when I'm doing these assessments and I'm, you know, I, I point out, hey, here are your containers that don't have count sheets. And, you know, do you have these electronically? Yes. Okay. Because they're still sitting in a drawer somewhere. And, um, and they, they and it's a stare at, so they don't use them, but they still have them in a computer. They have them in a drawer or something. It's like, send these to me. We'll get them uploaded into your system. And then now they've got them in there. And I think the, the stare at B pro, um, those are the biggest ones that we see where there's not a count sheet. And so people kind of either just know because they've been there um, forever or they they guess. And yeah, the camera light cord's in there, but you're missing some things. Or think of a scope, um, a rigid scope. Yes, but you're missing the light cord adapters. So you're going to have that accuracy then, which that's hard to put a dollar figure on. Yeah, no, that's that's a great answer. And I think, you know, based on your experience and your assessments and being in the facilities, are there improvements that you could see happening to the current technology? You know, I know since you're working with it every day, are there things maybe you're like, well, we could do this with, you know, our count sheets or we could add this process to where it's faster or more accurate um you know i maybe maybe elaborate on that if you wouldn't mind yes yep and so yes i think that the number one thing is your specific instruments so if i have if my um count sheet just has on there add some with t or it just says um kelly clam rankin all these different things okay but you want that specific instrument information. I want a product number, a manufacturer, and a description to say what size. As we know, there's all different lengths of these instruments. Or that description, is this with teeth or without? Is this curved or is this straight? And so with that, getting that specific information in there is going to help. And people say, yes, but we have different manufacturers. You know, we have, you know, we number three knife handles we have, you know, we have every manufacturer out there. And I understand that. But the thing is, is who is your preferred vendor? So take your preferred vendor and then open up a container and then put those ones on that count sheet to build that count sheet 
or to take and change that generic instrument into a specific. And you may have to open maybe a couple. So if I don't have, if this tells me, um, you know, so if this tells me that this is a, I need to have a, um, it just says Rankin curve. And I open up this container and this has ABC vendor, but our preferred vendor is XYZ. Well then go over your field pack wall, go over here, your backup supplies and find the one with the XYZ vendor and then put that in there. That's great. And, and um, you bring up a great point and just came to mind is what do you think the vendor's level of understanding should be of these tracking technologies? If, you know, if their instruments are being used on that end, uh, what's your opinion on that? Yeah. I, well, one thing is, you know, I think back where when we had the paper catalogs, you flip through those and you go to the back of the catalog and I could look up, you know, ABC dash one, two, three instruments. That was this vendor. And it would tell me the XYZ comparative. So it's nice to have that um, kind of that flip flop of different vendors and how I could see that. So that was great. Um, and so keeping that going, um, you did find sometimes where they were a little off, not quite the same, or you had surgeons that don't you dare put an ABC vendor in my tray. I only like XYZ because <laughs> uh, you know, we know that happens. Um, and so I do feel vendors need to have that better understanding, that importance, that we can't just say all of these needle holders are the same, or all of these scissors are the same. Not all male curved scissors are the same. And while everyone strives to be unique and different, which I get, because then you have your surgeons that like one, one or the others, um, at the same time, understanding kind of the difficulties and the challenges um, I think more that goes down the line of IFUs and, and reprocessing those more than what's on my cone sheet. Um, You're right. you know, if everything could just be ran at 270, 10 and 40 or four and four, like what a wonderful, beautiful world this would be, but you know, it's not that easy. All right. <laughs> right. Yeah. And I think if everybody's IFUs were always understandable and clear, you know, there's, there's that whole discussion that we've gotten into many times. <laughs> right. Right. Okay. Well, I think I'm good on that. Uh, Melanie, do you have any other questions? I don't. This was very helpful, though. I I can't tell you how many times as the OR nurse, I was told, put this on my count sheet, take this or put this on the on the tray, take this out of the tray. And then I, I was the team leader for orthopedics. And so I have multiple ortho docs all using the same trays. But this one is adamant. We don't need this. This one is adamant. We absolutely have to have it. And I don't know, walking that fine line between making everybody happy and when do you just put it on the tray so they'll they'll be happy and be quiet and when do you try to get make sure we always have peel packs available so we don't put it on the tray because only this one doc needs it. It was yeah. it was frustrating. But I, I can see a lot of the benefit of a tracking technology like this that would keep everything accurate because really you're right. Accuracy is so important when we go to open that tray and we open that tray, we have what we need, we can do our cases um, it really does come down to making sure we have what we need for our patients. So I can definitely see the benefit to tracking all of that and going through the effort to make it right. So definitely. Yes. And, and you know, and the key thing is minimize who has access to make those changes. Yeah. You know, as I said, one to two people or two to three people, it's just, you don't want too many people making changes. Yeah. Too many cooks in the kitchen, right? Definitely. Yeah. We don't want, I don't need all that. Okay. Well, this was excellent. I really enjoyed it. Thank you, Kelly, for the critical insights that you gave us on count sheet improvement. Um, everyone, thank you for being engaged this early in the morning. We did have some good conversation after the presentation. If you had a question and you did not submit it or didn't get a chance to, um, we will make sure that Kelly receives your questions. You can just put it in to the Q&A right now, or you can contact her through the contact information on your screen. Um, you can connect with her via email or LinkedIn as well. Um, now, after this session, your screen will automatically transition you to the next session. But as a reminder, there is a 15 minute break between each session throughout the conference today. If the registration page appears and you've already registered, please click the already registered link and enter your email address to enter the event.
you will be able to access the CE survey and certificate at the end of today's six sessions. And just a reminder that you will see bonus CE content found in the resources window on the right side of your screen in each of today's sessions. All sessions will be available to you on demand to share and view after today's live event. We are so glad you're here and we will see you again in about 15 minutes. Thank you. Bye-bye.